first let me say thank you to the organizers for uh, letting me give this talk. This is something we actually had this data at AppGradCon last year, but I couldn't present because we had just gotten it, and so I sat on my hands for the whole conference. Uh, so I'm actually really happy to tell you about this because I think you guys will really like it. Um, so uh, before I really start, there are a bunch of people I have to say really helped out with this, including our session chair, Brett. Uh, this wouldn't have been possible without the work of a lot of people. Uh, so to talk about discovering molecules in space, first I'd like to take a step back and think about how chemistry works in space. So uh, we start with a star exploding. Uh, this is a hard reset for the chemistry. You get some dust, but mostly it atomizes everything, blows it all out into space. Eventually it aggregates back into these big clouds of gas and dust. These condense further to make a star and a disk around, as we heard. Uh, eventually we uh, form planets. These pick up the rest of the material, and in a couple special cases, you get life. <laughs> yeah, so that's sort of the broad overview. So uh, as an astrochemist, what I'm interested in is looking at the chemistry throughout this process, because from here on, the chemistry is constantly running, building bigger and more complex molecules. And so uh, at each one of these steps, the chemical inventory depends on the step before it. So if you want to think about how you're going to build life on a planet, one of the things you need to think about is what gets made throughout this process, what, you know, what processes are happening that affect how the chemicals form and what you start with. Uh, and in general, we do pretty well with this. So we can find all the basic molecules, aldehydes, ketones, alcohols. Uh, like Brett said, the bigger they are, the harder they are to detect. So we're generally limited to fairly simple molecules. But this can still tell us quite a bit about what you would expect to start with. But one thing we've never actually found is a chiral molecule. And that's kind of a big thing. Because if you want to think about how life works, life runs on chiral molecules. And if we can't find chiral molecules in space, we can't say anything about what pro you know, when or where they form or what processes may influence how they form. Uh, so just real quick, I'll back up in case, just to get everybody on the same page. I'm sure most of you know chirality. But uh, chirality comes from the Greek word for hand. Uh, and your hands are a really good example of this. So uh, chiral things are things where their mirror image is not superimposable on itself. It's not geometrically the same. So your hands are not mirror images. They're identical, but they are not superimposable on themselves. And like your hands, molecules can be chiral too. And no matter how you twist them around, they're not exactly the same. Uh, interestingly, they have all the same physical properties. They melt and boil at the same temperature. They have the same basic spectra. Uh, but they do distinguish themselves in one important way, and that's when handed things meet other handed things. So if you think about a handshake, you do it the right way, it's fine, uh, but two right hands meet, it's awkward. And the same thing happens with molecules. So you can think of a chiral molecule binding to some chiral site. Uh, one way works well, the other way does not bind nearly as well. And so uh, this is kind of the trick, is you have to actually have something chiral uh, to distinguish a chiral thing. Uh, and the reason we're really interested in this is this thing called homochirality. Again, I'm sure most of the audience knows what this is, but just to go back over it, uh, homochirality is this interesting property of biology. So biology runs on chiral molecules. And interestingly, it runs on all the same handedness of chiral molecules. Essentially, uh, for instance, you run on all left-handed amino acids. So you use entirely left-handed amino acids and right-handed sugars. And this lets you do a lot of interesting things. Uh, you can build things like alpha helices and uh, the sort of double helix structure of DNA. It's just not possible to do that unless you actually use entirely the same handedness of a molecule. And so this actually is evolutionarily <coughs> sorry, advantageous. Uh, right? You can build these big structures. And so it makes sense that you would evolve to this at some point. You would innovate to be homochiral. The interesting question is uh, not whether you evolve to this. It's what handedness you pick. Like I said, all, you know, both enantiomers have the same essential physical properties. So when you're faced with the choice betwe between two seemingly identical things, how do you pick one? Uh, and the way I like to think about it is sort of a three-step process. First, you generate some excess of one enantiomer over the other, some small fluctuation in one direction. Uh, then you amplify this. So there are lots of autocatalytic uh, processes where you could think of once you get a little bit, that catalyzes making more and more of it. And then you template this onto more interesting structures and run away with it. So really, if you want to know why you picked the handedness you did, you have to think back to what generates your initial enantiomeric excess, what drives you in one direction. And people have thought about this quite a bit. I'm sure a lot of people in the room have thought about this. Uh, if you're thinking about sitting here on an early Earth with a primordial soup, there are lots of ways you could do this. Uh, surface catalysis, things like binding to clays preferentially. Uh, noise, it could be totally random. Just a small fluctuation in the chemistry could bump you in one direction. 
Uh, there are more exotic things that have been proposed, like the electroweak force. It's incredibly weak, but operating over a planetary scale for millions of years, you could make the argument that it would push you in the right direction. And then things like circularly polarized light. So like I said, handed things distinguish themselves when they see other handed things, and light can be handed too. So circularly polarized light will preferentially destroy or do preferential photochemistry. But uh, I'm an astrochemist. I'm interested in absolutely none of these things. <laughs> so uh, what we're interested in is uh, the material that actually starts, on, uh, that starts out in space and ends up on the Earth. And so this is actually kind of backed up by uh, meteoritic data. So if you look at things like the Murchison meteorite, it's chock full of interesting molecules uh, for building life. And one of them is amino acids. And even more interestingly, if you look at it, there are small excesses in the, uh, the amino acids. So you see a small uh, excess of left-handed amino acids in the Murchison meteorite. And this is a rock that formed at least four and a half billion years ago when the Earth was still a pile of gas and dust. So this is, these are molecules that were formed in space totally abiotically well before you have planets even, so, or roughly the same time. So not only can you make these interesting molecules that then eventually make their way intact to the Earth well before you ever make a planet, you can actually start with an excess way before that. And that can be the bias that pushes you that way. So if you want to think about what processes make chiral molecules in space and what might actually push, uh, push you in that direction, you have to actually detect a chiral molecule first. This is something that hasn't actually been done. And that's a real problem because if you can't detect a chiral molecule, you can't go out and look at astrophysical processes that might actually be doing this. Because if you could figure out what processes push you, you know, what gives you that little excess, you could actually make, uh, you could start to think about, okay, well, is that, does that happen just for the Earth? Does it look the same if you make life somewhere else? How universal is this and what's going on? Uh, and so the two ways we're really interested in doing this are, first, there is this really cool paper somebody showed that uh, carbon-14 beta decay gives you spin-polarized electrons that are universally one-handedness. And this can preferentially destroy chiral molecules. So if this was the way it worked, you would expect this to be uh, universal. So not only would you see the, you know, the same handedness here on Earth and Europa and halfway across the galaxy, it'd just be the same everywhere. The other one is circularly polarized light. So you can get cer very strong circularly polarized UV light in a lot of sources, and it changes. So uh, from here in Orion down to the Horsehead Nebula, you see big changes in, you go from linear down to, circ or, sorry, circular down to linearly polarized light. So you can actually go out and just observe sources, figure out what the circular polarization is, and then make some claim about what you expect uh, the, the enantiomeric excesses to start looking like if you're building molecules in these places. So these are the kinds of things you could think about testing if you could actually find chiral molecules in space. Uh, so that's, that's what we work on. So uh, I'm part of the PRIMOS project, the Prebiotic Inter Interstellar Molecular Survey. Uh, it's a radio survey. So like Brett said, uh, our best tool for detecting new molecules in space is uh, radio astronomy. And for reasons that are not entirely clear, Sagittarius B2 North is a small, actually fairly large cloud of gas and dust very close to the center of our galaxy, 28,000 light years away. And it is the best place to find new molecules in space. So uh, if a complex molecule has been seen in space, it's almost definitely been seen there first and pretty much always seen there. So if you want to look for new molecules, this is the place to do it. So we got interested in this and started thinking about how to detect these molecules. So uh, if you want to detect molecules, you go for the biggest telescope you can. Uh, telescopes are like buckets. Uh, the bigger the telescope, the more light you catch. So the Green Bank Telescope is the world's largest fully steerable radio telescope. Arecibo beats it. but. Uh, this is easily the biggest one that can actually observe Sagittarius. For reference, this is the Statue of Liberty. It's huge. Uh, and so we have this project in with the Green Bank Telescope. It's actually so useful. We've just got this huge archive of data we can mine that's already been done. So we started digging through the data. And uh, we initially got these two hits. So these dips are uh, the rotation, so the end over end rotation of the molecule absorbing against the background of Sagittarius. And these are just the quantum numbers. But uh, as we dug through the data, we initially got these two hits. And we got really excited because two hits is a really decent chance that it's a real molecule and not just something spurious. 
So we actually have good statistics. We can look at the whole data set and see what incident, how often you get small absorption features from something, either a molecule we can't identify uh, or just uh, any instrument response. And so it's about 3% chance that you have an absorption that would fall randomly, just randomly on this uh, frequency. So for two of them, it's 0.09%, which is actually pretty good for us. We, uh, this is a pretty sound detection, but it's not good enough. Referees really want to see you do more because there should be several more detectable transitions. So we went and looked for the next one in the series. So this is the no this is sort of the RMS from before, and this is what we got. This is not signal at all. It's direct TV. <laughs> yeah. So it turns out there is a geosynchronous satellite TV, uh, satellite right over North America broadcasting right at this frequency. So it keeps going a little bit, but. There is, when you're looking for really weak absorption features from 28,000 light years away from you, this is unacceptable. You just can't do anything with it. So the solution was to go to parks in Australia. They don't have a telescope, they don't have any, uh, uh, sorry, satellites broadcasting at that frequency. And their telescope's not quite as big, but it's 60 meters instead of 100. And it's pretty phenomenal for this. And so we integrated, took us most of the week, and we got a hit. So this is the last absorption feature we were looking for. So now we can put it together with the other two. And now the odds that all three of these coincidentally line up with the transition frequencies for this molecule uh, are pretty much null. So this is it. We've got all three hits for a chiral molecule. And uh, actually, we can do a little bit better than this. The statistics were for this region. I asked, like, what's, how likely is it they fall within that window? but they all match up basically perfectly. So if you ask, what are the odds that uh, you get all three hits within that window, it's about one in a billion. It's pretty low. And we can also use this to derive the temperature. So the gas is extremely cold. It's about five Kelvin. And so now we can put this together. This, molecule, this is the molecule propane oxide. So we've got three absorption transitions from it. We also detect uh, two structural isomers. So I am a chemist. I do like to start thinking about how not just finding these things, but how they uh, fit in the bigger chemical picture. So uh, acetone and propanol are structural isomers, uh, and we put them together. We also found uh, simpler epoxides. So this has the nice uh, uh, epoxide ring. Uh, but anyway, we have uh, 21 to 6 to 1 ratio. So this is telling us this is way out of thermodynamic equilibrium. It's exactly what you expect. but. Uh, I need to hurry up and finish, so I'll skip the rest of this and just say these ratios look really close to what we see in comets, uh, and that's really cool. It says that this might be happening. This is the chemistry we might be seeing in the solar system, too. So I'll just wrap it up and say uh, we detected a molecule. It's chiral. It's propylene oxide, and we've got a lot of work to do now to figure out what this means. So thanks. We have time for questions. Bradley, were you saving a question? I do have a question. Okay. Sorry, he got in way early on the question train. And you have to use the microphone because we have a stream going live on SeganNet. So please wait for the microphone. So what do you have to do to figure out if there's a chiral excess there? Uh, so there's lab work to calibrate it, and then there's really sensitive, so basically you do circular dichroism. So you put, you measure the amount of circularly polarized light that's absorbed, and if you see an excess in one-handedness, but that is super hard at radio frequencies with a telescope for so many reasons. Is it a matter of time or technology? Uh, the technology feasibly exists. It's probably a matter of time. Calibrating a telescope to do this to the precision you need is incredibly difficult. Cool. Thank you. You stole his question. Oh, I'm sorry. All right, we got another one down here. Yeah, it's a fair question. Thank you. That was an awesome talk. Um, you mentioned at one point supernovae kind of reset the chemistry, but then talked about in the Murchison meteorite from the formation of the solar system there was already pretty complex things going on. Yeah. What's the? How do we reconcile that? Like, what's? How long do we expect that to take? Millions and millions of years. So uh, that's what happens is basically supernova explodes, that gas flies out very far away, and eventually gravity takes over again, it'll coalesce, and then you have millions of years of condensation, and like Brett said, and like uh, gas and grain surface chemistry just constantly runs and slowly pieces it back together, and then eventually it aggregates into a solar system and meteorites. So 
along the way, you start building up to things like amino acids. Right, but they're already pretty much going on before solar system formation then. Yeah, or there could be, I mean, chemistry is still running as the solar system forms. It's not one, it yeah. doesn't stop. So yeah, this, but yeah, they, they should be built before that. We're working, so we've tried to detect glycine repeatedly. This is like one of, it's like astrochemistry's, uh, one of its big goals and one of its constant stumbling blocks. We can't detect glycine yet, but we're working on it. Thank you. All right, we got to move on. Let's thank Brandon again. <laughs>